Welcome to the Black Film Space Podcast. My name is Londe Yusuf. And this is Reggie Williams. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. In our next episode of the Black Film Space Podcast, we interview Shannon E. Johnson, a former sci-fi executive and professional script consultant. We talk with her about how to pitch a room full of executives and how to receive and give constructive criticism on your script. So, here it is. Sit up. Hi, Shannon. Hello. <laughs> Can you tell us about your trajectory getting to the Sci-Fi Network? Sure. I'm going to take you all the way back to an eight-year-old girl <laughs> sitting in her third grade, third grade class. Uh, but anyway, um, that was kind of like the first time we did like descriptive writing in class. And so I think I spent like a couple of paragraphs uh, describing a blade of grass, like what color it was what it smelled like, what the wind was like when it went by. And my teacher, Mrs. Jones, said, you should be a writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you hear that kind of stuff from a teacher at that age, it's like, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I decided then that I wanted to be a writer. So I was always reading a book, always up and writing. My mother would have to come in and say, go to sleep, stop writing, leave stuff alone. So I knew I wanted to be a writer. But, of course, that can't be your day job. Like, you got to figure out what else you're going to do. So um, when I got to college, I decided to go into journalism because I was going to do magazine writing. So at least I'd still be writing, you know, for my day job as I figured out how to write novels or something like that. And it wasn't until my senior year that my mother randomly sent me a, an article, I think from Essence, and it was about TV writers, this black female TV writer. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. So I don't have to write a novel that gets adapted to a screenplay. There are people who just write, you know, straight to, you know, straight to the screen. So that's when I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I didn't know anything about screenwriting. I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. So I said, well, how about I go to film school? Because my undergraduate degrees are in English and journalism. So it's all writing, but none of it was screenwriting, which is so totally different. So I was like, okay, let me kind of start from scratch and go to film school. I decided to take two years off in between and I moved to Los Angeles, put everything in my car, lived on people's floors, nice. literally. Nice. <laughs> Almost had to spend the night in my car one night hmm. because I went down there to stay with someone and literally I got there and within a week her job moved her to another state. And I had just kind of gotten there. So it was like, where am I going to go? So I ended up staying with two people who I knew but didn't know. Like, you know, back then, I don't know if college kids still do this, but we used to like road trip, you know, go back and forth to other people's campuses. So I would see these people just because I would happen to be on their campus, had never really had a full conversation with them. But they were in Los Angeles and they were like, you can stay on our floor. And so I <laughs> stayed on their floor. Right. So I went and I got a lot of on set experience, you know, like PAing and stuff like that. So just kind of learning, like, who are the heavy hitters here? What do these titles mean? How does this stuff work? So I did that for about a year. And then I went to graduate school. Um, and my program was a uh, kind of dual degree between the film school, the theater department, in the creative writing department. And this was only its second year in existence. So they choose six writers. And so I was one of those six writers. So I got to do however many semesters of film, TV, but I also got to do playwriting and creative writing. Um, but it was there in film school when we would be doing our, our writer's workshops. Everybody would have to come in with their pages and we would read and we'd give each other notes. And my teacher said, he was like, so why are you so good at helping other people, but you can't help yourself? And, you know, in the moment you're thinking the shade, like, did you have to say that like in front of everybody? But, you know, also it was like, yeah, Shannon, like, why can you do that? And I realized I loved that. Like, I loved going to our writers groups and listening to everybody else and going, OK, so this is what should happen and you should do this. And this is how you can get out of this and blah, blah, blah. But then I would look at my own stuff and I go, yeah, I don't know. You know, and so I took that to heart. And, you know, maybe again, going back to that teacher thing, my third grade teacher said you should write. And then here was my, you know, college professor saying, but you're really good at that thing. And so I kind of took that to heart. And when I was looking for what I was going to do after graduate school, since I had already done the Be Broke LA thing, I was like, I don't know if I want to do that again. So maybe, you know, instead of going out there and trying to figure out how to become somebody's TV writing assistant and work my way up and blah, 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 and possibly never have it happen, 
let me see what these corporate jobs are like. And to be honest with you, when I applied for this job slash program, they, they kind of put it out there like it's a program. So that's kind of what got me. Mm-hmm. Um, they said, you know, we're bringing in people to fast track them to being creative executives. So we're kind of going to teach you along the way is what I assumed because it said program. So I'm like, all right, cool. Um, and when I applied, I didn't even know what development meant. Like I I didn't know, but I was like all the other stuff around. It sounds like stuff I do. So I'm just going to apply and see what happens. And I was the only person that they chose who was not sitting in Los Angeles already working on someone else's desk. So it was like, oh, great. You know, maybe I'm special. But at the same time, I was so far behind everybody else Mm -hmm. because everyone else had been working people's desks. So they already knew all the names of the people in the industry. They already knew what they should be doing as this creative executive. I came in thinking, all right, who's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do? Because it's called a program and I don't know. And I was set up for failure. Mm. I mean, set up, you know. uh, So I kind of ended up being this person who was waiting on tasks to be given to me. It was one of those those situations where I didn't even know what questions I should be asking Mm. because it was that new to me. Film school is about production and writing. So if I were on a set, I would either know what to do or at least know what questions to ask. But being in the business part of it, I didn't even know what questions to ask. And to be honest with you, uh, when I got there, I'm not going to say who, but he basically said to me, you need to be seen, not heard, Mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what a creative executive does. Right. Um, But he said it to me and he was very high up. So he was someone I had to listen to and he meant it. And so... Was this like after watching you work or just like initial... day one. Oh, that's gross. Like day one. So A, I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. B, this wasn't a program, so no one was teaching me. And C, I'm supposed to be seen, not heard. So how do I learn? So it took me a long time to get out of the funk and kind of try to figure out, like, what am I supposed to be doing here? Because I'm not one of those people who likes to get paid on a job that I'm not doing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, yeah. other people are like, girl, ride it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but for me, I'm just kind of like, well, no, but they're paying me this and I'm here every day. And, you know, they gave me a couple of tasks to kind of, you know, do around the office or whatever. But I was still just like, this just doesn't seem like what I'm supposed to be doing, especially when we would meet up with the other um, people in the program and mm-hmm. they would be telling me all the stuff that they're doing. They were running shows and they were doing this and doing that, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, huh? What? So one of the other girls in the program actually, you know, told me you need to start meeting with people like you got to go like basically creative executives are at lunch with people all the time. You got to go meet with writers. You got to go meet with directors because you're basically supposed to be a mental Rolodex of the up and coming people. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, great. Where do I find these people? So, you know, I figured it out. I started going on meetings. But what helped was I was kind of the second on every show. So what creative executives do is all the shows that you see on their network are divided amongst all the creative executives on the floor, right? So everybody might be working on six or seven projects that are actually on TV, and then they're working on plethora of projects that are in development. And so I was kind of like the second to the other five executives that were there. And most of them also took that attitude of be seen, not heard. So I would be doing my notes, which I'm very good at. And then I would have to give my notes to them. And then they would go into the room and I would get to be in the room, but I wasn't allowed to speak. And they would go into the room and then they would be giving my notes and be getting credit for stuff that I was saying. Mm. But it's not my place, especially in front of the clients and everybody to be like, well, that that was me. Hey, hey, I did that. Um, so like a year and a half later, we kind of got a new executive that was a little bit more laid back and whether it was good or not, he basically handed a couple of his projects to me and was like, you do it. I was like, great, I'll do it. And I did, but I got more of an education in my last like six to eight months there than I did in that whole year, simply because he just threw it at me. And I told him, you know, I appreciate it because I would rather have the opportunity to fail so I can know where I'm going wrong than to, you know, just be in the background and not be getting anything because all of the other people in my program were getting promoted. They were already getting other titles. And I was like, you know, I don't need to be promoted because I don't know what I'm doing at this level. And the last thing I want, again, I'm not that person. Don't give me the title and give me the extra money and I'm not doing the job. Like that doesn't make any sense. So with all that said, I finally got to the place where I was overseeing some of the projects. So if I had to go out to the sets, I would be the most senior person there. And at that age, uh, I believe I was like 27. Wow. And which means I looked 19. 
Yeah, because you <laughs> look 19 now. Right. <laughs> exactly. So when I would go onto the set, everybody would have to tighten up, you know, because I'm the network, which means whatever happens, it has to come from me. But also, I'm a young black woman, mm-hmm. A, and then I'm a young person. And, you know, some of these directors have been in the game for X, Y, and Z. How but, did they react to seeing you? Um, I think no one ever outwardly mm-hmm. had anything to say. Right. But when it came down to it, once I was someone who was put up front and they could hear that I was getting backing from what was happening in L.A., then there were no questions. So, for example, this is one of my favorite stories to tell. So when you're developing a show, the creative executive is a part of every part of the process. Every part casting right set design wardrobe so we were going back and forth and back and forth about what this particular actor should be wearing should she have earrings or not i was the most senior person on the set we stopped production for hours about earrings wow because it says so much about a character it does and this particular character uh is a detective so you know are detectives going to be girly? You know, is her hair down? Is it up? Does she have on earrings? If she does, what kind of earrings are they? Do they dangle? Are they pearls? Are they stuck? Like, what are they? Because once you put them on her and it's on the screen, now that says something about who she is. So we had to stop production, look, you know, look through earrings, call back to L.A. Because obviously I might be the most senior person on the set, but I'm not the most senior person in the building. <laughs> so, you know, call back to L.A. and get these answers and keep going. But ultimately it ended up being my decision because I was the only woman. The only female executive. So even mm. the person I was calling was a guy. So and he didn't it, really know either. And he was just like, they're earrings. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> they're not just earrings. Right. Um, so that's kind of how I got there. And I actually really enjoyed it. And a lot of information was thrown at me that I wasn't prepared for. Because when I got into it, I thought, I'm just going to be working creatively. I'm going to be working on scripts. I'm going to be giving notes on that. I eventually realized that also meant giving notes on dailies, which is all of the the shooting that they're doing each day. They send it back and the executives have to go through all of the footage that's been been, um, given and give our notes on that before it can actually be like, boom, this is what you're going to see on television. So that was cool because I hadn't done that before. Um, But what I was not prepared for is that creative executive is like the end all be all of that show. So we also have to be the person who comes up with the marketing plan and what's going to happen with the digitally and all these other things. And back then, digital was like not even something people were even really considering. So it was so new. This was like in 2009, 2008, 2009. Uh, actually having like this was before people were making content digitally. Right. This was like when you can maybe watch some shows online, mm-hmm. like like Hulu was like very, very new. Um, And so that was a weird space for me because I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually way too forward. But I was like, you know, don't we have people in marketing? Like, why is this my job? I'm not. My, I don't know much about marketing. You know what I mean? Like, why am I telling the marketing people? what the vision should be when this is what they do Mm. or why am I figuring out what's going to be, you know, on our website about this particular show when we've got a whole digital group of people over here. And so it was, you know, cool to understand that it starts from my vision. It starts from me to say, Hey, this is what I'm thinking it should be. This is where it should go, blah, blah, blah. And then I tell the marketing people and then they take it and bring things back to me, but it still has to flow through me. And that was information that I just, I wasn't prepared for uh, when I got there. But I'm glad that I had that experience because now when I'm working with writers, I've got all that information. And I'm like, look, this is what's going to happen <laughs> when you get there. And you have to think about how all of this is going to affect your work that you're putting out. So that was a long way to tell, to give you your answer, but that's how I no, got thank there. thank you. <laughs> that's great. Um, so how and why did you transition into script consulting? Okay, great. Good question. This is the best. (laughs) Um, So there I was working at the Sci-Fi Channel and I was in a place of transition anyway. I was thinking of uh, going to another network, um, possibly just to work in a different um, in a different genre. Because, you know, at Sci-Fi, obviously we're doing just science fiction. And so I was like, okay, well, let me see if there are other uh, networks out there that I could possibly work with. And One of my friends contacted me because she had gone to an event at her college and a dance company called Step Africa had performed. And she called me and she said, so why aren't you doing that? 
I said, um, well, A, I have graduate student loans. Um, B, I have a job. So I'm like being an adult. And she's like, well, I think you should look into it. And that was like the end of the conversation. And I was like, okay. Now, at that time, I knew two people in the dance company, but I didn't know anything beyond that. I had never Googled it, never looked it up. I just knew two people in it. And you would think if you got two friends who randomly joined the same thing that you've never heard of, that you would go, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. Never thought about it. But when she called me, I was like, okay, now this is the kind of the third thing sending me this way. So let me go look into it. So it turns out that they're uh, a dance company and they're the first dance company dedicated to stepping and African dance. They actually do South African dance, the South African Zulu dance and the South African Gumbu dance. And I was like, okay, well, I love to step. Who knew that you could step for a living? I didn't know you could do it. Here they are. And they've been doing it. So I was like, all right, I'll figure out when these auditions are. So I had to tell a fib and say that I wasn't feeling well so that I could go all the way to Washington, D.C. to audition for this uh, this show. And while I was in D.C. during the auditions, I'm supposed to be on a call for work. If you don't know anything about um, at least being a creative executive, and I'm sure it's the same for anybody in Hollywood, but you're always working on vacation. You're working like hmm. if there's a call like my superiors would be on vacation and we would be on a call and they would be on it. You're sick at home. Awesome. Our calls at nine. I'll, 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 I'll talk to you then. So here I am on a Saturday sick, but in Washington, D.C. at this audition. And I'm going in and out of the audition because I'm the person who has to put the call through and connect everybody to the call and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But my service was really bad. And it went out in the middle of the, in the, middle of the call. And I was just like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I have a job when I get back, but I got to go back into this audition. So I went back into the audition. And so before I went to the audition, though, because uh, I want to make sure I say this. Before I went, I was like, let me call my mother and talk to her about this. You know, mothers are all knowing. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to call her and she was going to say, Shannon, you're an adult. You've got a full-time job. You've got a salary. You've got benefits. You should just kind of do that. But I called her and I said, okay, there's this dance company in Washington, D.C. And they kind of travel the world. And I'm thinking about doing it. And she said, do you know what? You only live once. <laughs> I was like, what? If my mother is saying you only live once. <laughs> Then this is something I got to go do. So yeah. I went to the audition and I said, well, if I don't make it, it's OK, because I do have this salary job and cool. But if I do make it, maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I went about 75 people audition. They chose three people and I was one of them. Nice. So I had to move from Los Angeles. You have good luck. <laughs> <laughs> one out of six, one, one out of know, three. That's amazing. Yes, I'll oh, well, take it. I'll take awesome. it. Awesome. <laughs> so I um, moved to D.C. And so even though I was in this dance company and I was on the stage and it was like, it takes, Step Africa is 365. I tell people this all the time. If it's, an org, if it's a dance company that you want to join, you know, it, you don't have a life there. However, I have never stopped enjoying the written language, even though I don't necessarily have the passion to write anymore. I have the passion to help others. So maybe about four years later, because I kept figuring, trying to figure out, like, how can I still be a part of this world, even though my world is so separate and secluded? Because when you're traveling the world, you're like you're on a plane for this amount of hours, like I had an apartment and I probably saw it 15 percent of my time. I was paying rent. Wow. For a place that I never saw. That's how much we traveled, which was great. But, you know, at the same time, like, how, how can I fit in this other part of my life that I really enjoy? So maybe about 2012 or so. So I got in Step Africa in 2010. And I would say maybe somewhere between 12 and 14, I started trying to you know, work with writers. At that point, I was working with all kinds of writers because a lot of my friends know that I proofread. So I was doing all of that for them. Like it was a novel. It was a magazine they were starting. It was an article. It was whatever. And I was like, yeah, I can do some of that. But I kind of, I had this meeting with this brand. You know, everybody's into branding now and everybody's teaching people how to brand. So I had this meeting with this uh, kind of brand uh, ambassador person. And she basically said, well, if you want to focus on screenwriting, that you have to stop focusing on the other stuff. She was like, I'm sure that, you know, you're getting those are gigs. So you're getting money from it. But she's like, but if if your services are so broad, then you're not going to get specifically what you're looking for. So you got to let all that other stuff go. And she said, also, if you're trying to make this something that can actually be your full time job, you're going to have to charge the prices that big time companies are going to want to pay because if they see that your prices are low, then they figure you're an amateur and they're not going to want to work with you. And that was hard for me because 
I know that a lot of novice screenwriters don't have that kind of money. I mean, we're out here just trying to, you know, just trying to live. So I was like, okay, let me find something in between. And of course, since then, I've been able to increase my prices a little bit. And hopefully one day they'll get to a place where I'm charging $10,000 like some other people are charging. $10,000 oh, per script? What? Oh, there what? are people. There are people who are charging $25, $40 per page. To revise, proofread. Oh, no. Come to the black film space. <laughs> right, for, for $5. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Do you think that's worth it? You know what? It Because of the time that it takes, if you're going to be revising and proofreading people's stuff, because of the time that it takes, and if you've been in the game long enough where you're receiving four, five, 10, 20 scripts a week, then at that point, it's like, that's all I'm going to be doing is sitting wow. at this desk and reading this stuff and sending out these notes because you're on a deadline. If you send it to me, that means you want it back in a particular amount of time. So I personally think, sure, it's ridiculous. How could you p- charge $25 a page? But if you go and look at the WGA fee list, you'll realize that people are charging more than that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Are they working for studios or are they getting like independent filmmakers? Because I mean, the average person, you know, right. can't afford that. Right. Exactly. And it's probably coming from a studio point. Yeah. Of view. Like if a studio pays someone, they have to charge. Well, then I mean, yeah. they have to pay the WGA fees. Yeah. But again, we're in a, we're in a world of entrepreneurs. Everybody's doing their own thing now. So on this particular person's site who I saw was charging $25 a page, $40 a page, blah, 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 blah. She's had some success in the business and she is working. A lot of times they're com- the studios are coming to her. But other times they are just regular people who are coming. And I'm like, yo, she is making a killing. Like mm. who is signing up for this? That's thousands of dollars <laughs> That's per thousands screen Thousands of dollars play. per screenplay. So let's exactly. say you read three to a week. That's like in the tens of thousands. Yes. That's a really right, good which money. Which means that's her full-time job. That's awesome. Because she's charging that. Now, I'm not at that place yet. And, you know, I, I, I go back and forth with it because it's like, if that's what it costs, and this, these people are in Atlanta, they're not even in LA. I'm like, if that's what it's costs and that's what people are paying, then, you know, why can't I be living this lifestyle? Like, you know, what is it? But then there's that other part of me that says, but that's the point. Everybody's just trying to make it. Everybody is out here trying to put their, their money and their time into their art. And they're not trying to get like run over by a bus just because they need you to proofread their stuff or just because they want some notes, you know? So I, I kind of understand, uh, that little area as well. But so I've been since about 2012, 2014 just trying to hone what this business is. And to be honest with you, just only in the past couple of months have I gotten bold enough to just start reaching out to people because a lot of it is just people don't know you exist. Like, I know that I'm good at this. This is what I do really well. But people have to know I exist in order for me to have clients in the first place. So, and now look, here I am on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Because you reached out. Yeah. Thank you. So what is the... uh the benefit of going to a script consultant versus uh, having your colleagues read your script? I think the biggest advantage is you should be working with someone who has been in the business so they can give you the creative's point of view. Because at the end of the day, if you're not going to be an independent filmmaker, if you're not making your own films, if you're not shooting your own films, if you're not editing your own films, that you have to consider somebody else's point of view is going to matter. And they're coming from a different space. They're coming from money matters. They're coming from we live in a box and these are the kind of things that we like to produce. And that's just, you know what I mean? What it is. Um, They come from a place of we like to work with who we know. Um, so when you come to a script consultant, hopefully they're able to give you that extra information, um, and not just, you know, say your script is good or your script is bad. That's never my, that's never my intention. And I have people ask me that all the time. So is is it a good story? Do you think that, you know, someone will produce it? People produce anything. Sure. <laughs> like, that's really my answer. If you go to the movies right now, I guarantee you that there's a movie in there that you think is crap. And then somebody else is sitting in there like, this is the best movie ever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's the same thing is happening. It's all subjective. So even after you have sent it to your colleagues and you send it to me and then you get to the studio exec and that particular studio exec might go, yeah, but I, I don't like it. Or this is not what I'm looking for. So something else that I tell people when they come in and they say they're getting ready for pitches, and this is usually, you know, television uh, more so than film for me, is you got to know what that network is looking for. It doesn't matter how great your idea is. For example, when I was at the Sci-Fi Channel, I cannot say that it's the same thing now. But back then, Sci-Fi was like, we don't do horror. Horror is not Sci-Fi. Science fiction 
That's what we do. And so at that time, The Walking Dead was trying to shop around. And we were like, we don't do horror. Mm. Are they pissed that they passed? (laughs) I don't know, because, you know, your brand is your brand. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And at that time, it wasn't. I can't say if it's their brand now, but at that time, it just just wasn't. But, you know, a lot of people passed on it. That thing went, you know, around everywhere until they found a home. Which is what usually happens for her shows. Exactly. Same thing happened with Dancing with the Stars. I feel like they went to NBC first, and NBC was like, who wants to watch this? Wow. And now, 10, 15 seasons later, (laughs) it's still there. So, on your website, it says, quote, I understand the sensitivity of your story being your baby, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'll tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. The film industry is a hard one. Grow a pair. Mm -hmm. Smile. End quote. (laughs) Um, Can you elaborate a little bit on what you see from from writers in regards Mm -hmm. to, like, their baby and, you know, just holding on too much to their idea? So, I tell people all the time, let it go. Leave it alone. Cut it. Cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut it. And the thing is, because especially for most first time writers, usually after you've written two, three, four, five things, you've kind of gotten over this a little bit. But it's the same thing when you're a parent. You have that first baby. You think my baby is the most beautiful baby in the world. There are no other babies that exist. Everybody wants to put their baby on Facebook and give them their own Instagram page and thinks that they're going to become like the next Michael Jackson or whatever. And the same thing is true about your script because you've put so much time and so much effort and you know that it needs a little work but you're so overprotective of it that you don't want to do the work and you don't want anybody else to do the work and you just want to leave it like it is and you have to allow that baby to go out and become a real person like you know Pinocchio become a real boy because if you keep your child locked up in a room No matter how great that person is, when they come out of the room, they're going to be socially awkward, (laughs) right? So the same thing is true about your script. If you hold on to it so tight, then no one ever gets to see your great movie. You got to let that thing go. You also have to be prepared for criticism. So I used to be a cheerleading coach, right? And I used to always tell the cheerleaders, I don't want to talk to your parents. I don't want to talk to your mom. I don't want to talk to your dad. I want to talk to you. If you have a problem, you come and talk to me. We'll figure it out together. Because your parent is looking at you like, you're my baby, so you're perfect, and everything you do is awesome. So then I would have parents come up to me, why is my child on the back row? (laughs) And then I would say, have you seen your child? Mm. (laughs) You said that to me? Yes. Because when when it's your baby, you don't see it. But what you're ignoring is these other children out here. Who are jumping higher, yelling Mm -hmm. louder, their motions are tighter. You see your child in the back halfway moving. And you want to know why they're not in the front. So the same thing is true when you think about a script. That's your baby. You can't tell them that it's wrong and they don't want to change anything and everything is perfect. And so then I'll say, okay, fine. Well, just leave it like it is then. (laughs) You know what I mean? But um, so I just, I, I tell people that A, You got to leave it alone. Once it gets to a place, you just got to let it go. Because a lot of the times we're, we'll want to keep working on that same script. And now it's 10 years later and we're still working on that same script. You just got to stop. You just got to literally leave it alone. How do you know? You don't. Like like marriage. It's subjective. So how do you know when to say, okay, this is enough? You don't. Which is why you have someone else look at it. Which is why you come to another person who can give you that, um, that uh that opinion that is a little bit uh has a little bit more information because of the industry et cetera they can give you that expert opinion if you want to say because you don't but if you've gotten to the end let someone else look at it because the other thing is true even if you just get to the end and then wait a month and come back yourself and reread it you're going to see Okay, there's some things I can tweak. You might not want to rewrite the whole thing from top to bottom, but there are a few few things I can tweak and move around. But after you've done that four or five, six, seven, eight times, give yourself a deadline. I told one of my writers, you know what? Then just tell yourself on January 1st, that's it. I'm I'm just I'm not writing anymore. Not on this script. I also tell people, go write something else. Just start something else because you want to be writing, but you're so concerned about this baby that you forgot about your middle child. And now look what happens to the middle children. Mm. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Mm. You can't be so focused on baby number one that you forget that there's a whole nother child in the room. Go write something else. 
Where do people get stuck, though? I think people get stuck because they think that their idea is so great that they don't understand it's not about the idea, but the execution. Okay. And it's about how I get from A to B to C. It's not about A, B, or C. Because if you think about it, in this day and age, originality is like out of the window. Everybody's just making the same thing over and over. So it's about how they did it, not what they're doing. And I think a lot of people get stuck on, I got the next best idea. And this idea is better than this, is better than that. Oh, it's exactly like that. And theirs got on TV or blah, blah, blah. So they're so into that idea. The idea is their baby. It's not even the scripts, not even the, you know what I mean, the words on the page. The idea that they can't let that thing go to say, just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it belongs on TV. Mm. It doesn't mean it belongs belongs on the screen what it could mean is it helped you to hone your writing skills so that the next five things you do maybe that sixth one gets on the screen because a lot of novice writers also don't understand that unless you're making that movie yourself nine times out of ten nothing is going to happen with the first thing you write it's just not because hollywood has a gate up they don't know you you don't have an agent you cannot submit um you cannot just submit anything uh, unsolicited Right. So you've written this great thing. But in real life, how many people are going to see it unless you send it to a, you know, a film festival? And sometimes good things can come from those. Uh, there are different programs at the networks that you can apply to. They have writers programs and they'll help you to kind of get your script honed and blah, blah, blah. But even after you hone that script, it's still just to show people you can write. Those first things that you write are to show people you know how to write. It almost never makes it to the actual screen. And I think. If people knew that, they might not hang on to that baby so tightly, you know? Mm -hmm. So what, what's the best way to give and receive constructive criticism? Oh, that's good. You know, when people work with me, I am, I do try to be as blunt as I possibly can, but without being rude. Because I also feel like you just got to give it to people. You can't go over the river and through the woods. People really have to understand what it is. And I think as far as taking criticism goes, you got to be open in the first place. Like you can't come to a writer's workshop and not want to hear anything people have to say. Like, why are you here? You have to be open to it. And then when you first get your notes, because when I send notes, I send extensive notes. And some people actually find that to be rude without realizing, well, if you get script coverage from any other place, they're not going to give you notes. What they're going to do is they're going to say what kind of writer you are. They're going to say whether this should pass or fail. And that's it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you this right here, child, you need to get rid of that. <laughs> and this over here, I'm not sure where this is going. And why is this storyline here? These people don't even matter. and Nobody likes them. Why are they here? You know, and I'm going to give you extensive. I'm even going to go page by page and say, see this on page, blah, blah, blah. What she was talking about, that didn't make any sense. And it, you know, just took up our time for no reason. But with that being said, if you get the notes and you're like, oh, my God, it's so much. They hated it. Give yourself again. Take some time. Leave it alone. Walk away. Come back when you're not so emotionally invested. Mm -hmm. Reread the notes and realize that they're just a guide. Because at the end of the day, it is yours. You don't have to take any criticism. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you say the kind of writer you are, what do you mean? Most of the time, what you're writing is probably not necessarily going to be the thing that makes it to the screen. Okay. So when a reader receives your writing mm. and they have to go back and tell the executive, because the executive is not the first person to see it. There are going to be people who see it before it even gets to the actual people who make, you know, who yeah. make the, the decisions. Think about, you know, American Idol. They saw 15 people before they got to that room with Simon. Right. So the same thing happens when you submit your scripts and that reader needs to be able to go back to the executive and say the story idea is this, this or this. But regardless, this person's a good writer. Or this person can't write and the story idea is awesome. So they might decide story idea is awesome. You can't write. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy your script, give you your money, send you on your way. And then we're going to hire someone else to come and rewrite it. Or they'll say this is an awesome idea. This is not what we're doing right now, but you're a great writer. You seem to be really good at suspense. Well, guess what? I have this other suspense script over here that needs some work. Why don't you take a stab at doing that script? Okay. Because you seem to write well in that area. So that's the other reason why I say you can't get so hung up on the script. You have to understand that it's like if you were a basketball player, you would go to the gym every day and you would shoot hoops. 
and you would run and you would do push-ups and you would do all these other things. So all of these scripts that you're writing are just helping to hone you to be a better writer at that specific thing. Whether you're a comedy writer, a drama writer, a dramedy writer, if you do thrillers, if you do suspense, if you do horror, if you do whatever it is you do, do that well because a lot of people first make it into the industry because they realize you're a good writer at this thing. So I'm going to stick you on these other projects that exist. And now that I know your name in, in this area, now maybe I will look at your original idea, you know, that came into the room. So when you start to essentially tear a script apart, (laughs) right? Sure. (laughs) How do you, how how does that process work? How do you start to break down the nuts and bolts of each script? Mm -hmm. I, you know, for me, it's not, um, It's not too complicated. I literally go page by page. And usually in the industry, people won't give you past 10 to 15 pages. They get 10 to 15 pages in, which is probably why you guys are reading your first 15 pages, right? They get 10 to 15 pages in. They're like, this this isn't doing anything for me. I'm going to let it go. Now, for me, obviously, you've paid me to read your entire script. So I'm going to read the entire script. And 90% of the time I do. Sometimes if a script is so much of a mess, I don't waste my time. Because I know where this is going. And I can already give you the notes that you need before I even get to page 150. And I'm like, why do you have 150 pages? It's supposed to be like 120, right? 110, it can be 150. But if that if your story is not guiding you to 150 pages, <laughs> you're just writing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, And that's the thing. That's the other thing I say about like writers thinking that it's about them. It's not about you. It's about your characters and the story they're trying to tell. Not, oh, I got this cool idea. Let me throw this into a scene. But what does that have to do with what's going on with this film? Um, so I go page by page. And as I and, and this is why it takes me kind of a long time because I don't read and then write my notes. I write them as I go. And so I'm on page one. Half the time I can't get paid past like page five without already having like X amount of notes. Wow. Because a lot of those, you know, problems start happening there. But Even more so, it's awesome and terrible at the same time. When you read those first 15, you're like, yes, this is going to be awesome. And then they lose it. And then you're like, oh, okay, here it is. This is, this is where the work comes. So what page does that happen? Oh, like if it it usually will happen like in the forties, okay, thirties to forties, because the second act I always say is the hardest act to write. Really harder than the third act. I think so too. That's what I think. I think so too. I'm a person like if I ever write again, I'm going to need a writing partner. Because I can give you a hell of a first act, (laughs) a hell of a third act, but that second act. And the reason is because people don't understand, regardless of what story you're telling, the breadcrumbs have to happen in the second act. You are setting up all the revelations in the second act. You are showing us how your characters are trying to solve the problem in the second act. And a lot of the times people just spend the second act wasting time until they get to the third act. And then they give you everything in the third act. So now your characters were just kind of sitting around talking, sharing the same information that I already told this character on the last scene, but now I got to go tell this other person. But as the audience, I got to hear it again. Like, you know what I mean? Like what is actually happening? All of the action, all of the forward movement. That's when the pace starts slowing down in the second act because people don't know where they're going. Cause nine times out of 10, they did not write an outline. So they're just writing. They're just in front of the computer and they're just writing. So they don't know where it's going. They know how it ends, but they don't know how they get there. And that's why I say the idea is not what matters. It's the how. It's not even the why. Like at the end of the day, who cares? Nobody cares. How? (laughs) You know, how are we getting there? And that second act is all about the how. And most people just don't know. And they're just writing until they miraculously get to the end. And so that's where usually it just falls apart for some people. They start mm. off really great and then it falls apart. And the same thing was true for me. It will fall apart in my second act because, sure, you have this detective story, but what do you really know about investigating? Nothing. So now you've got some cops who need to do some investigation, but you don't really know how to do that. And people don't understand the research that you have to go do to write your stories, you know, to write your, your screenplays, because it's all going to come to the surface in that second act if you have no idea what you're talking about. If you're writing a... Uh, uh, a story about doctors and some specific field and you don't know anything about how those doctors do their job, then what are you writing? 
you're going to just start going any and everywhere trying to get around it, but you can't get around it. It has to be specific in order for it to be relatable, in order for people to like believe your characters. And so that's when I go back to your writing because you want to write, not because your characters had something to say and a place to go and a, a goal to reach, you know? Mm -hmm. And what about the first five pages? You say a lot of uh, writers struggle in the first five pages. What are you seeing in, in those first five? Um, Again, just going back to a lot of people don't realize that format from a screenplay to a TV show to a play to a novel are not the same. And I'm not going to name any names, but there are big time people out there right now who have the world thinking that you can just take one thing from one place and put it in the next place and it just works. And it's just not true. So a lot of times people spend so much time setting up things that they're forgetting this is a film. There is momentum and I need to know what the problem is. I don't care about all the rest of this stuff. If you can't get me to know who your characters are as we're still moving forward versus you're spending five pages to tell me about old girl. I, and then later on, old girl wasn't even important to the story, but we just spent five pages on her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Why? Um, so I think a lot of people don't understand how quickly you have to grab someone. And I don't necessarily even mean by the time it gets on the screen, but again, you have to remember the gatekeepers. So many people are going to read it before it, ever has an, an opportunity to get on the screen unless you're making it yourself. And so if you're not, you know, quickly making these people relatable, quickly giving me a way into this world, and then quickly setting up what the problem is that needs to be solved, and then this is where they also fail in those first like five, 10 pages. Now that you've said what the problem is, you've got to quickly put your characters into a plan of action. Now that they know they have a problem, they can't ignore that problem because your audience is sitting home going, wait, but your child got kidnapped and let alone. But we're watching in the in the sh in the um, screenplay or on the screen. We're watching them having coffee and chilling. Mm -hmm. But your child got kidnapped on the last page. What You know what I mean? Like move these people into action. There has to be a plan. Now, that plan can end up failing. But there has to be a plan. So a lot of the times none of that really happens. And then I go back and I always have to ask them, so what's happening here? What's the problem? I like that. And I try to do that. But sometimes when you're writing like a niche project and you're having people who are, may not be from that world, mm -hmm. can you set it up? Can you tell me more about this character? And I'm mm -hmm. like, guys, it's going to show on screen. Like, how do you help people to realize that it doesn't have to be said? You can't because you're not in the room. You sent your script to them and that's all they have that's on the page. Which is again why I said, if you're not making it yourself, mm -hmm. Hollywood is a box. They want you to live in that box. And it isn't until you get a such and such name that you can decide to do what you want to do. Like Jordan Peele could do that because he spent all this time right. on TV, <laughs> you know, being funny. And eventually say, well, I want to make my own film. And they were like, great, you can do whatever you want. But if he had tried to make that film 10 years ago when nobody knew who he was, they would have read, read that thing and put it right off to the side. So you have to remember that it doesn't mean you can't make niche things, but that niche still has to fit into that box because somebody else is going to have to read it. And then they're going to have to sell it to somebody else, not you. A lot of the times the writer isn't in the room, especially if they've already paid you. They don't care what you think. <laughs> they've paid you and they've sent you on your way. So you got to figure out how to still do those things if you're going the Hollywood way so that you can get to the place that you want to get. Because again, I don't know if y'all are watching Love Is, but you see how much uh, old girl is selling out so she can get to where she wants to go? Mm. She's like, she's got to write an episode about a pig. That's not what she wants to do. That's what she has to do. Mm -hmm. And eventually, of course, I mean, of course, we don't know yet if she's portraying someone in real life, but we know that Mara eventually becomes who she is. So obviously probably that chick is somebody that we know as well who got to eventually make, oh, of course. you know, her own stuff. But when you're starting off, got to fit within that box because somebody else has the money. Okay. But then also, because now they're saying like, you know, black programming is popular. Mm -hmm. So they want to see unique voices, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. I guess my question is, how does someone emerge writers and readers and watchers into a new world but still balance the act of how, what people are used to seeing mm -hmm. when they're writing their script because it's it is hard for a, a lot of screenwriters yeah. to write something that still feels 
explainable to someone that's not from that world. Right. But still can possibly have an audience, you yeah. know, if you pitch And there's it. no real answer to it. Yeah. Because really, you just got to find what works for you. And then also going back to not every studio is looking for the same thing. Mm-hmm. So you got to figure out which studio can handle what I have going on. Like Netflix is doing some stuff that ABC is not going to do. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Hulu's doing some stuff that NBC can't do. So you just have to decide if this is the world I live in. Also, read other scripts. Like, you know, obviously, right? Like, there are probably some shows out there that somehow, some way live in this world that you're talking about that's, you know, just yeah. a little a little different. So read their scripts and see how they did it and then see how that can work for you. Not to say, you know, copy what they did, but mm-hmm. see, like, what that format is to get you into that same place. And, you know, and just figure out what works for you because the answer is not, you know, true for everyone. How I often, mean, same thing. How often should uh, screenwriters be reading? I think, you know, people would say read all the time. Um, but I think that you have to a from the if you've never done this before at all, read everything. Right. If you've been doing it for a little while and you know specifically what you're writing for, because I think a lot of writers don't understand that, especially in Hollywood, you have to pick a lane. They're not going to let you be comedy and horror. You can be. but They're not going to let you. They're not going to let you be comedy and drama. Like when you come in, they're going to say, what kind of writer are you? Because guess what? They're going to say to you, if you just wrote on Law and Order SVU, you're not writing on Blackish. That's what because of the boxes. It doesn't mean you can't, but you have to prove yourself in one place so that they can know where to place you. And then again, once you become Shonda Rhimes, you can do whatever you want. But if you're not Shonda Rhimes, then you have to stay in those lanes. So I think you need to decide what kind of writer am I? So even when it comes to, to features, do I do suspense? Am I doing rom-coms? Like, what is it that I'm doing? And then read people in those lanes and see how they're writing. Because also format has changed so much. It's the same, but just a little bit different. So see what the formats are. Because every TV show, especially now that there are half hour single camera shows, those are not written like multi-camera shows. Okay. And if you're not reading scripts, You don't know. And then you'll say, okay, well, I'm doing multicam. Yeah, but Martin multicam looks different from um, Friends multicam, which looks different from blah, blah, blah. So you got to figure out what lane you're in and then be reading that stuff, even if it is just for the reference at that moment. I don't necessarily, you know, think that that means you spend every day, every night reading other other people's scripts, but you just kind of got to know the world. You got to know what's out there. Okay. And uh, we wanted to ask you some questions about pitching. Mm -hmm. Um. What kind of questions do network and studio executives ask you after your pitch? Good question. Um, I'm going to talk about TV specifically uh, because I know that world a little bit more than film. They're going to want to know kind of where you see this thing going. Um, I don't necessarily tell people when they do their pitch that they should talk about the whole season. I like for you to wait for that to be a question. Because if not, then you've talked about all these things and you've given the executive so much information that now they have to go back and try to figure out, okay, wait, what is this show about? So I usually tell people, keep it pretty simple. Talk about who the show's about, excuse me, and what the engine of the show is. Like, what are we going to see from week to week? Not specifically, but like, is this a procedural? Like, are they solving a case every week? Is this like brothers and sisters from um, ABC? Is it going to be like some big family dilemma every week? Like, what are we going to see? So then at the end, when they want to talk to you about what else it has, to, uh, what's the growth of it, then you should know where you expect the season to go and where you expect the series to go. And I think at the beginning, especially in your first pitch session, they're not going to talk to you too much more about anything else except for just kind of the story and and uh, kind of where it is. Um, eventually, because there are so many stages of development, then sure, eventually you'll have questions about casting and you'll have questions about um, marketing and blah, blah, blah. But when you go in, you should know your audience, but you cannot. To me, if you're in the room, then that means you already know your audience because every network doesn't have the same audience. Mm-hmm. But if you're pitching to a studio, which is not the network, then you need to know what your audience is because that studio then goes to pitch to those networks. So they've got to know what your audience is. So a lot of the times, you know, we kind of go and we go, well, anybody would want to watch this. Sure, they would. 
<laughs> but who's going to actually watch it? And so that might be more research you can do with ratings and stuff like that. Look at Nielsen to see who's watching the sh- who's watching a show that's similar to my show, and how can I, you know, get these people to come and watch me? Um, so yeah, but I think you know your first time in the room, they like to keep it brief. They're not going to ask too many things unless they just didn't know what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Now they have to ask a lot. It's like, so what and who and you know why? But I think if you're specific enough and simple enough to just say it's these people doing this thing in this world then they have enough information to then say all right cool what else okay and what are some faux pas uh that you see people uh pitching in the show uh the faux pas is telling us every single detail of your pilot (laughs) if i want to read the pilot i'll read the pilot i'm in here because i got five minutes literally like when they take these meetings, first of all, they're going to cancel and reschedule and cancel and reschedule about 15 times before you make it into the room, especially if they have no idea who you are. <laughs> so by the time you get into the room, you got to utilize that time to get your information out. The other faux pas is thinking, I got this meeting based on this idea, this idea. I don't want to hear about the other five ideas you have. Again, I don't know you. Now, if you are Will Smith, you can come here and talk about what you want to talk about, <laughs> but you're not. You're whoever you are and you come in and you have your one solid thing because guess what? If they like that and if they develop it and if you do well, they're going to ask you, don't you worry. What else do you have? What else can we work on together? Because they want to make money just like, you know, you want to be creative. So So have it in your back pocket. Have it in your back pocket, but it's not for that conversation unless they ask you. Right. And if they don't ask you, worry about the relationship. Because if you build that relationship with that person, even if that particular thing that you pitched didn't go well, you have a relationship now. So you can hit them up some other time and say, hey, I got this other thing. It's about this. You know, that's why you have your log line. It's about this, this and this. Is that something you might be interested in? No? Yes? All right. They say yes? Cool. Let's get it on the books and you'll come back in and you'll pitch. Uh, Lastly, you always want to leave something behind. But again, leaving you don't leave your pilot behind unless that's what they ask for. A lot of the times when you go in to pitch, the pilot hasn't even been written yet. You have your idea. You go in because guess what? They're going to pay you to write the pilot. So whatever it is you've done on the pilot already, they might not even want any of that stuff. So why would you want to leave it with them and they read it and go, this person can't even write? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Don't give them something they didn't ask for. But leave behind the big picture things. Who, what, why, where, what you might be seeing in this season, what you might see for the series. And that's it. That way, when they're trying to talk to their boss later and say, oh, yeah, such and such came in and this is what it was about because they they need their notes and they have it and they're able to pass it on. And then from there, they'll take you through every step of the development process. Got it. Got it. Um, what materials should someone bring to pitch? Obviously, we know some sort of written material. Yeah, I would, I would say just to leave behind. Unless they've asked you for something else, because it's it's going to be different. Like nobody has the same experience. If the other thing is, if you're new in a way where it's like, oh, they, they kind of just randomly called me in here for some ideas and they probably already read one of your scripts. How else did you get in there? You know what I mean? So I personally wouldn't bring anything except for the leave behind of this idea that I'm talking about. And it has my contact information on there. It has everything they need. So that they don't have to call me for questions because the last thing you want is to send them into the room unprepared to pitch you. You know what I mean? So you want to give them enough information, but don't overload. Don't download. This is not one of those moments where the details matter. Like we don't care that. Oh, and then in season two, her mama (laughs) gone. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) What is the show about? I don't even know her mom and I don't Mm -hmm. care about her mama. You know what I'm saying? What is the show about? Oh, the show is about angels. Great. Why are we talking about her mama? You know what I'm saying? But we get so excited, you know, because it's our baby. And we want to talk about how, oh, and her pink bows in her hair. And then she went and got this <laughs> and she got that, blah, blah, blah. And the people are like, I didn't ask you any of that. So just like stay on topic. Um, it's also good to do a little research about the people that you're going to see. Google happy, Google exists now. So at least when you go into the room, you can kind of start some conversation, you know, about, oh, I see that you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that kind of stuff. If I was on the other side, I would go, I don't care. I just want you to pitch. But some people care about that schmoozing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. For me, I care more about you came in, you did your job. And because I liked what you did, we're probably going to get a relationship from this. I don't need the fake part of the other thing. But some people like that. So you just kind of go in, acknowledge that, or at least acknowledge how this meeting happened. 
you know, acknowledge that, oh, I know Shannon and she told me, oh, yeah, Shannon, blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Or, yeah, my agent told me this or you read this and how did you like that? And I see you like such and such movies, whatever, for about five minutes. Then do your pitch. At the end, stop, shut up, stop talking and let them ask you questions and then answer that question. A lot of times, you know, someone will ask a question and now you're answering. Again, you talk about the pink bows in the hair and nobody's talking about your children. <laughs> So, you know, answer those questions, ask them if they need any other information, leave something behind and then wait for them to contact you and tell you what's next. And a lot of the times in the room, depending upon how big of a company it is, they might tell you, oh, this is not something we're looking for right now. But, you know, thank you for coming in or this is not something we're looking for right now, but I've read your writing. So we might have something else for you or they might not say anything. And, you know, five months later, they call you up. You never know what's going to happen. And I do think that it's cool to at least write back and say, thank you for seeing me today. You know what I mean? But again, that doesn't mean attach five more scripts that you wrote. They're not going to read them. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they might find it presumptuous and might say, well, this person is like just trying to get on in any kind of way. You know what I mean? So. Can you talk about the pilot episode and what executives specifically look for in it? Okay. So I'll talk about my, my specific uh, experience. And most of the time we started off at ideas. Therefore, we wrote the pilot together. I didn't have too many times where the pilot came to us and then we picked it up. But if we did, it's just going to depend on network to network. Again, like if it's something that they're looking for and if they're looking for it, then they're going to start from, you know, character work. They're going to start from, um, you know, plot, but mostly because of the machine, like what's going to happen week to week. Like you can have a great pilot but by the end of that pilot, your audience kind of needs to know. What am I going to be seeing week to week? Because nobody's going to come back every week just to see people sit at a table and talk, no matter how much they like those characters, right? So they're going to be kind of looking through that and just kind of fixing it and massaging it. And that might mean bringing in other writers. And that sometimes hurts your feelings. But now that they've bought it, it's theirs and not yours. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then once the pilot has finally gotten to a great place, then they start talking about casting and all that other stuff so that they can uh, shoot the pilot. But it's definitely going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, from studio to network and even to the executives. Okay. Thank you so much, Shannon, for, uh, Ooh, for being part for of our podcast. Yeah. You're amazing. A lot of great information. Yes. Thanks. Um, so where can fe people find you on social media and find your services? Yes. Awesome. So my website is www.awriterforyourwriter.com. That should be easy for you to remember. A writer for your writer. And my Instagram is at the professional pin. And I'm also on Facebook, the professional pins. So you can find me there. My services are all over the place. And if, even if you just have any questions, I'm a person who answers questions. So you can DM me and ask me a question or two. <laughs> and I will always answer them because I believe that you have to build trust with people first, especially with creatives, because it's their baby. <laughs> if they don't trust you, they're not going to leave it with you. <laughs> so I definitely am open to like, hey, girl, I got this quick. So how does this work? OK, cool. But you can understand that I'm here for you. This doesn't help me other than the fact that it's my job. You know, it's your work and I want it to be brilliant just like you want it to be brilliant. So, OK, thank you so much, Shannon, for coming. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. All I right. had fun. Thank you for listening to the Black Film Space podcast with a very special guest, Shannon E. Johnson. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Black Film Space and look for our private Facebook group so you can learn more about opportunities and post gigs and things like that. We have screenwriting workshops once a month, usually on the third or fourth Thursday of the month. So please RSVP. And thank you to Comic Strip Live for allowing us to record mm -hmm. this podcast all right, y'all. See you soon. Woo -woo. Peace. Later. Peace.